Welcome back everybody, this is Eric and Chad here with IRAC Veteran 8888 and today we want to make a special video that's a little bit outside of the norm. Uh, some of you may remember the video that I posted recently on firearm safety for the new gun owner uh, where we discuss all different types of safety uh, for your new gun acquisition and not to mention loading magazines and some other uh, intricacies related to the most common firearms actions. What we wanted today to be about is now that you've kind of gotten the grasp of that, we want to dive into the true cost of gun ownership and, uh, and sort of look at this as a total sort of thing that people need to consider, okay? Being a gun owner is not just buying your firearm and then buying a box of ammo and then loading it and putting it on the bedside. Like, there are other costs. If you want to look at being a firearms owner from the aspect of being a full-spectrum firearms owner, then these are many bullet points here that you're going to need to consider. And uh, we want to break this down in a way that is easy for people to understand, especially that might be new to the firearms world. Um, there are many things to consider. Uh, being a well-rounded gun owner is a pretty intricate thing, but once you get the basic concepts down, uh, I believe you'll find that not only does it make you a more well-rounded person and make you more responsible as an individual, it'll also allow you to appreciate your new purchase that much better and to be safer. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing we always drive home is for everyone to be safe. The last thing we want somebody doing is, you know, doing something that is going to harm themselves or their families or anybody around them that's just an innocent bystander, right? Uh, with the ownership of firearms come certain responsibilities that we owe it to ourselves to adhere to, just like we wouldn't buy a, a power tool and not read the manual and go out and use it and cut our foot off or our hand or some heinous thing like that. Uh, any tool can be misused and we want to make sure people are using the tools in a safe manner, but they also understand the upkeep of that tool and what's required to not only keep it going, but for you to get the absolute amount of use out of the firearm that you have recently found yourself in possession of. Now, whether or not you're a new firearms owner or if you're a guy that's owned a gun for 30 years, this video will still help some of you in some way, shape, or form. So bear with us. This is going to be kind of a long video, but we want people to be informed of the hidden costs of being a gun owner. <laughs> there, there are some <laughs> hidden costs that people may not consider, okay? This is, this is like one of those little uh, ads you see when you're browsing online. It's like <laughs> It's, you know, you're scrolling down through an article and you see the hidden cost of gun ownership. It's like click, 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 well, click. Well, but but look, <laughs> hey, there, I mean, <laughs> there are some costs that some people may associate yep. as not being something they thought about, mm -hmm. and that's what we want to clear up in this. Oh, absolutely. Video. All right. Um, so, so, uh, what do you think? so with with gun ownership, you can really compare gun ownership to car ownership. Okay, when you think about owning a car, you don't just go to the dealership and you buy a car and then that's it. You just drive the car and you're all happy go lucky. Um, it doesn't work that way. You know, you have to feed the car, right? You got to put gas in it. You have to change tires. You got to change brakes. There's all sorts of consumables that you use up on a regular basis. Uh, there's accessories and things like that that you want to do. There's uh, big problems that you have that you'd have to take it to a mechanic, i.e. a gunsmith, okay? Right. There's all these things that are very, very comparable to vehicle ownership. So when you go to the gun shop, you initially buy your gun, okay? Well, what do you buy with your gun? ammunition obviously you need to feed your gun right so that's pretty much the first initial cost that most new gun owners are going to have they're going to go to the gun shop buy their gun pick it out and they're going to get some ammunition to go with it and they're immediately going to go where to the range right yeah they're going to go mean, to the range or they're they're going to usually purchase some form of an accessory mm -hmm. and that accessory usually is additional magazines now that's the first barrier that you're going to run into when it comes to the true hidden cost of owning a firearm is that some magazines you're going to notice are not very expensive some are really expensive mm -hmm. so you need to consider magazine cost and factor that into mm -hmm. uh, a gun like don't get me wrong, I love H&Ks, but like if I bought an H&K Mark 23, that wouldn't be a good first handgun for somebody. But let's just say in fantasy world, I bought a Mark 23, and then I get sticker shock when I find out that the additional magazines are 80 or 90 bucks. So some magazines are more expensive mm -hmm. than other magazines. 
So that is certainly a consideration, mm -hmm. and you need to consider not only the cost of your additional magazines, you need to consider the cost of the ammo mm -hmm. uh, that you are getting your gun chambered in, right? Uh, you know, there's going to be a big price difference in shooting 5.7 by 28 or shooting 9mm, 45, 40 cal, or getting a, a handgun chambered in a real oddball cartridge like 357 SIG mm -hmm. or 45 GAP or something like that. That's more specialized the ammo is, mm -hmm. the higher the price is going to be Absolutely. to shoot it. So those are two very important distinctions. It, and those costs are going to follow you for the life of that firearm mm -hmm. when it's in your ownership, right? Uh, ammunition are like the batteries of a gun, and you're going to consume that ammo and need to buy more. Okay, I know that goes without saying, but ammo is a really important thing to consider is the cost of the ammo for your gun and the magazine mm -hmm. costs. So two very important things. Yep. So depending on whether you buy like a pistol uh, to start with or a rifle, you're going to have some other accessories that are going to be specific to that particular firearm. If you buy a handgun and you're looking to maybe conceal carry it, you're probably going to purchase a holster at the same time. So that's another accessory cost. And right. holsters can range anywhere from $20 on up to over $100, depending on the make, model, manufacturer, materials, uh, materials things like that. Um, you know, inside the waistband, outside the waistband, hybrid holsters. You can get into all these different rabbit holes. Sure. Um, if you're buying a rifle, you might purchase a sling or you might buy an optic. Okay, so when you get into optics costs, that adds on an additional uh, cost, sometimes a high cost on top of the rifle. A lot of times, if you purchase a $600 AR, you might want to put a high quality optic on there. Well, a high quality optic might run you four or five hundred dollars. Uh, if you're talking about a red dot, if you're talking about a variable power optic, you might get on upwards of five, six hundred dollars. If you're talking about an ACOG, you might be talking about eight hundred, nine hundred, or a thousand dollars for something like that. Um, so you have all these costs that stack on top, but they do make the firearm itself a lot more useful oh, and yes. enhance the capability of that particular platform. Right. Um, weapon lights. Uh, some people will choose to pick up like a weapon light for their concealed carry handgun or something that's for home defense. They might decide to put on a, a weapon light on their rifle if they're going to carry it in their vehicle or have it for home defense. So you have all these things that pipe on there. Uh, yep. You know, you might want to buy a suppressor, okay, to keep it quiet. Well, sure. tack on probably more cost than the gun was itself. So, absolutely, you know. I would consider, and, and this is just me talking here, and, and, and don't get sticker shock when you hear this, but... <gasps> I would I would factor in if you're wanting to put an optic on a rifle, you're probably going to need to factor in at least what you pay for the rifle. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I know that's a hard thing to the hard pill to swallow. A lot of people are like, oh wow, six hundred ninety nine dollar AR, but it comes in no sights, and you got to have an optic. And, and like even just dropping on like a basic um, aim point or uh, a Trigicon MRO mm -hmm. or um, something to that nature, like a good basic red dot. I mean, you're talking that kind of money, again, mm -hmm. that you're gonna have to spend. So don't factor in just the cost of the gun, factor in the optic. And then of course, there's many other costs that kind of intrinsically go along with this as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like any good home defense uh, long gun needs a sling. Mm -hmm. It's super important. You don't know if maybe the situation's under control and you just need to sling the gun to keep it handy. You might need to call the police or use your phone or check on your baby or use mm -hmm. both your hands for some tasks. It's important to be able to have that gun slung and have the ability to sling the, the rifle or shotgun. And what type of sling you go with is dependent on a m bunch of different factors. Mm -hmm. But in your budget, make sure that you factor in at a minimum at least a sling uh, for your home defense uh, long gun, okay? Uh, he mentioned weapons lights. I feel like beyond anything else, especially for a home defense unit, weapons lights are super, super important. And it's something that I believe is commonly overlooked. And the price on weapons lights can really vary a heck of a lot depending on what you buy, okay? Um, different brands cost more than others. Some are more expensive. Some units are super ruggedized and super tough. Um, I know like the uh, cloud defense units are probably on up there in terms of really good quality, okay? Well, but cloud defense is also a really expensive light. Surefire makes a really rugged light. Uh, you'll see every, every type of weapons light from prices ranging from 80 bucks all the way up to 500 bucks, depending on what you buy. Mm -hmm. Mod light makes an exceptional light. Uh, I, I will say that's actually one light that I haven't had a chance to physically play around mm -hmm. with just yet, but I've heard a lot of people saying great things about the mod lights and the cloud defense lights. 
Um, I don't own a Cloud Defense yet, but I do want to get one eventually. Um, I've just gotten into buying some Surefires. I just picked up a 340 and a 640, which are their new somewhat modular lights that also include an M-Lock rail section in addition to the Picatinny mounts. It gives you a little bit more flexibility out of the box. They're finally getting with the times. They are getting with the times. <laughs> uh, now, now, granted, Surefire does represent a considerable cost. They do. Many people would associate Streamlight with being kind of like not the price level of a Surefire, but still excellent quality. Yeah. Uh, where the Streamlights are going to lose a few points are going to be on the switching. Uh, some people, you know, the switches might fail after a certain amount of actuations compared to a Surefire. Um, do your research. Don't take someone's word for something. If you're going to put a weapons light on your gun, especially if you're only going to buy one weapons light, do the research, spend the money, buy once, cry once, and get the absolute best thing that you can afford that you feel is going to protect your family. I mean, and that's really just the bottom line on that. But I feel like any home defense firearm whether it involves a long gun or a pistol you can put lights on a pistol you need to have a weapons light because identifying your target properly is not only the responsible thing to do but you don't want to just blindly shoot at something that you can't properly identify that's just not responsible right like we all want to identify what we are going to potentially shoot or not shoot. How do you know if what you're aiming at is something you want to shoot if you can't properly identify it in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. Weapons lights, pretty important, and you need to consider that into the cost, especially if you're the kind of guy that's only going to buy one or two guns and that's it. You owe it to yourself to spend the bit of extra money and put a light on your gun. It will help you drastically in the long mm -hmm. run. Absolutely. Um, another thing to consider when you're purchasing a firearm, uh, given what type of firearm it is, you need to think about parts support, parts availability, parts cost, because eventually there are consumable parts on firearms that will wear out over time and with use. Um, things like extractors, recoil springs, firing pins, strikers, firing pin springs, striker springs, yep. recoil spring assemblies, all these parts constantly in motion. Okay, They're constantly getting worked. They will wear out over time. Metal on metal contact will wear things down over time. You'll have to have spare parts to keep these guns running. 100%. Um, we've talked about this in other videos, uh, but given whichever type of firearm you, you choose, the parts could be more expensive, they could be uh, less available, or they could be in plentiful quantities available everywhere. Uh, um, we, so. we have an entire gun gripe episode dedicated just to part support and some of the things that you need to consider. So if you want to, if you're curious about part support for your particular gun, mm -hmm. we go into a lot of detail in that video. Go check that video out. Uh, we go into that much, much more than what we're going to go mm -hmm. into here. But yeah, Chad's absolutely right on that. Spare parts is really important. Um, the next thing to consider is, okay, your new gun owner. Hurrah. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, you need some training. You may have to have training in order to own that firearm, given where you live, um, permitting, things like that. Uh, but you know, training is a big part of firearms ownership because you want to know how to use your gun. Uh, just going to the range and getting some pointers here and there. You, most time, folks will give you some pointers on on just proper firearms handling stuff like that. If you're a new shooter, whatever the case might be, gun owners are usually very helpful with that sort of thing. But some professional level training would benefit you in the long run, especially if you are considering carrying a firearm for self defense. Um, and uh, training classes, things like that, uh, range fees, all that stuff can add additional costs to the firearm ownership total amount that you're that we're talking about here. Um, and then when you get into talking about like concealed weapons permitting and such, unless you live in a state that has constitutional carry where you can just legally carry a firearm uh, just with the Second Amendment as your license, you know. That's awesome, but if you live in a state like we do, like in Georgia, there is a permitting scheme here, so you do have to be permitted to legally carry a firearm concealed in the state of Georgia. Um, and average permit cost usually is about 80 bucks. Normal time for a permit expiration is about five years. Uh, different states require different uh, requirements, so you may have to have a specific class that you'll have to pay an additional fee for in order to get that permit. Uh, you may have to have um, a live fire 
class as well. So that might be additional cost plus the ammo cost. So you have to just look at your own individual state, but you know the cost of a permit might cost you three or $400. Uh, by the time it's said and done just to get that concealed weapons permit where you live. So yep. that is definitely a cost that is tacked on top of everything else that we've already discussed. So every jurisdiction is a little bit different in terms of how they handle the permit. So it's on you, no matter where you live, to understand if permits are required and what is required and get mm -hmm. it. So the cost of the permit is certainly something you need to figure into the entire uh, equation of firearms ownership. And then also I'll, I'll mention on the classes and training and stuff like that, there are tons of qualified trainers out there that are wonderful guys and do great work, okay? Many of them make videos right here on YouTube. Uh, John Lovell is an excellent trainer. Rob Pincus is great on the training end. Reed Hendricks at Valor Ridge does a great job. Of course, James Yeager does a great job. And there's tons of dudes out there that are doing lots of great training. And if you want to take like that level of training, you can, even if you don't take an advanced you know, type of pistol or rifle class, mm. usually the classes are going to be set up in a specialized type of uh, environment, right? So it's going to be you know, a, ha a combat handgun specific course where it's going to be, hey, here's combat shotgun. Like there are certain things to running a shotgun that you need to know. Con or carbine class. All of those classes are going to be mm -hmm. tailored to that specific type of uh, rifle, pistol, shotgun, whatever. So that's something to consider that there are specialized training out there that can go down the rabbit hole if you want. If you don't want to get any type of uh, you know specialized training, I would strongly recommend at least at a minimum just go to your local range. If you're especially if you're a new gun owner and you don't have any friends that know about guns, take a basic class to at least learn the basics and learn the fundamentals of marksmanship, side alignment, trigger squeeze, controlling your breathing. You know, all of these things are going to make you a, a more competent shooter. Now, it may not be the training level you need to operate under stress. But at least to keep you safe where you're not going to hurt yourself or someone else, that's important. So even if your jurisdiction doesn't require a training course, I'd probably go get at least some simple basic instruction if you're a new gun owner. It can't hurt. And that's going to be an extra cost, okay, in addition to the permit. Um, I will say, too, like there are some training aids that are available out there. Like uh, we did a video recently about the Mantis X training system uh, where you can either live fire or dry fire your guns and it'll tell you kind of what you're doing wrong and what to work on. And there is a little bit of an initial cost with that, but it saves you time and money if you're not going to the range and you're just dry firing at home and you're training that way. So when you go to the range uh, and expend some ammunition and spend that extra money, you're using your time a little bit more wisely and uh, you know saving yourself a buck or two but yep. um another thing too when you're considering cost of gun ownership is storing your gun safely so um most people will opt for like a gun storage cabinet or a gun safe of some kind so when you're talking about a storage cabinet you know storage cabinets can be had for a couple hundred bucks on the low end uh, but they don't provide any sort of fire protection or anything like that. When you get into gun safes, a uh, cheap gun safe might be three or four hundred dollars. Um, but you get really got to think about a lot of things. And we've we've talked about this in a previous video. Uh, we did a complete episode on um, storing your guns safely. We go over cabinet safes, fire ratings, uh, tips and tricks and things like that, uh, where to store your safe, uh, and just some other things to think about. So if you're interested in that topic in more detail go check that video out yep um good but, call but, i forgot that we did mm, that video but um gun safes are, are a popular item uh, especially if you have you know small children at home we we like to keep our guns locked up and you know out of the hands of our children unless we are there to supervise them okay you don't want to have unauthorized access to your firearms i mean let be your children your immediate family whatever the case might be or people who are not supposed to be in your house okay when you're not there you don't want people just getting into your safe uh, and just taking your guns or whatever. I mean, if you don't have a, a, a way to store your guns, they're just going to pull them out of a closet or something like that. And a lot of people just store guns in their closets or like up under a bed or something like that. And uh, it's just, it, it's, it's a way to protect your investment uh, more than anything else. Uh, you know, especially if you don't have kids, it's just protecting your investment. That's the whole idea. So Yeah, the storage needs are going to vary greatly um, based on, your individual situation, all right? And I, and I believe the most important factors are whether or not you have children, especially small children, and where you live, okay? If you're in a crowded apartment complex, 
and you're around a lot of people and they see you going in and out with gun cases or something, chances are you probably need to keep your guns locked up, right? Yeah. Uh, if I live out in the middle of the sticks and I don't have any neighbors, I could carry a Scar Heavy or a, or, or a, a Barrett M107 in and out of my truck and no one's going to care. Uh, ultimately, all right, it's on you to make sure you're storing your firearms properly. Mm -hmm. Not only do you not want them to fall into the hands of uh, you know small children or something, but you also don't want your investment being stolen. I mean, guns are obviously a very popular item for theft mm -hmm. uh, for many, many reasons, which we won't go into here. But yeah, thieves love guns, and we don't want people to steal our guns. There are very big differences between a simple gun storage cabinet and a safe that actually has a fireproof rating that's designed if your fire uh, occurs in your home, uh, or a, a safe that is designed to be like physically bolted down to the you know foundation, whether it's like down in the concrete or whether it's to the floor. So there are various levels of safes, and not all safes are created equal. But check out our video, and you'll learn everything you need to know mm -hmm. in that. So Absolutely. gun storage is something to consider. Whether you own one gun mm -hmm. or whether you own twenty, you need to try to have some form of storage to keep them safe. And you can also put your valuables, laptops, uh, whether it's your jewelry, uh, gold, or coins, or, or, or rare photos, or maybe your, your licenses and marriage certificates or mm -hmm. important documents. Uh, many things can reside within a gun safe, especially a fireproof gun safe can protect many valuables, not just firearms. Absolutely. So something to consider. Um, <clears throat> so, moving on. If you own a home, okay, and you're a firearms owner, um, you can place some of your firearms onto your homeowner's insurance policy. Uh, however, they aren't going to cover everything. Okay, so say your house burned down or whatever and you had uh, some firearms added onto your policy. Well, they're only going to give you X number of dollars. I mean, in the, in the case of my policy, it was like 6,500 bucks. And I'm like, well, you know, that ain't going to work. So there are firearm specific insurance policies out there that cover Guns, optics, suppressors, all kinds of accessories, things like that. Uh, Eric is a little bit more familiar with that. And we've talked about this in a previous video yes. as well. Yeah, so. we, ha we have talked about this, but I want this to be in this video mm -hmm. as well. And I'm just going to briefly mention it. Uh, I use Core Veins. Mm -hmm. Core Veins is, in my opinion, one of the best firearms insurance uh, companies that there is. And, um, you know, I, I don't have like a relationship with Core Veins. I'm a customer of Core Veins. That's it. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't. There, there's no connection to that. If you decide to utilize their services, that has nothing to do with me. But I'm a Corvain's customer, and I have been for several years, and uh, and it, they're a great a great setup. So basically, mm -hmm. you know, you just select a, a policy that works for you, and you pay your premium just like you do any other type of insurance policy. Mm -hmm. But Corvain specializes in gun collections. Mm -hmm. So if you have a collection worth a certain amount of money, usually. When you start getting into a collection of guns that's over like ten or twenty thousand dollars, then you probably want to look at a firearm specific insurance mm -hmm. clause because your homeowners just and some homeowners policies, if the bank is real douchebaggery, <laughs> they might not even want to cover the guns just because they're anti gun. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have a firearm specific policy mm -hmm. because they understand they understand that your that your scar has an optic on it that's worth as much as the gun. Mm -hmm. They understand that the suppressor costs a lot of money. They understand accessories and things. So they factor in accessory value as well as the value of the physical gun. And as you see, because you're understanding the breakdown of the cost of being a gun owner, now you are seeing that there are other costs. And yet, yeah, just because you've got a gun doesn't mean you don't have a $1,000 suppressor on it or a, a, a $2,000 optic. So mm -hmm. they factor in accessory value into what they pay in the event of loss. All right, so that's important. Mm -hmm. Consider a firearm-specific insurance policy, especially if you own more guns than your homeowners will cover. Yep, absolutely. Pretty simple. Um, now, <laughs> legal costs. All right, so you carry your firearm, okay, every day for self-defense. Well, you use your firearm in self-defense. Who are you going to call? All right, so we've been members of U.S. Law Shield for a good long while. They are a uh, concealed carry specific like insurance policy. Uh, so they have teams of lawyers all across the United States that will come to your aid, okay, if you are ever in a self-defense situation, and they will help you get through that without saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, and make sure that, you know, you're good, okay? Um, there's a lot of people that... If it's a legal shoot. If it's a legal shooting, okay. So... Nobody wants to be in that situation, but there are some states where, like, if you 
if you kill someone in self-defense, you go to jail. Doesn't matter, you know, if they were trying to kill your entire family. If you kill that person, you are probably going to go to jail. Um, and you know, there's states like Georgia, Florida, a few other states around the country have castle doctrine. So if you have someone in your house and they are trying to harm you or your family, and you shoot them and they perish, then the state can't touch you, but you still have to have representation. Uh, representation can cost several thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, given what the case might be. Yeah. So the the insurance or the concealed carry insurance and stuff like that, like U.S. Law Shield, like self-defense insurance, kind of helps alleviate a lot of that cost because it's a giant pool. It's just like any other type of insurance. Um, it, it's a big pool of members, and they draw from the pool. Okay, when someone is in one of those situations and uh, you have a certain policy that you pay each year, whatever the case is, and you maintain your membership, you keep a card in your wallet, and you're pretty much good to go on that account. Yeah, I mean, it, at some point, there, it becomes an issue of articulation, right? Yep. You'll have to articulate a story or an account to someone at some point, and it's better to have legal representation to make sure that you're saying what you're supposed to be saying and that you're not incriminating yourself because the issue is it's it what you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. So their job is to try to make you a criminal one way or the other. They're trying to get criminals. So they're what they're going to say whatever they can say to you and they're going to use it against you. They're going to yep. try to get you. They're going to buddy up and oh man, what happened? I know that was scary and they're going to try to get you to say something under duress. That could get you in trouble. So having proper representation is important to make sure that your story is articulated mm -hmm. importantly and to make sure that all the facts and evidence and things that surround the nature of what happened are considered to its fullest extent in a way that helps you uh, get out of this thing right. Um, no matter how cut and dry the situation might seem, if, if you are involved in something like that, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. I've been the victim of a crime. That's what you say. I have every intended, intention to cooperate with your investigation, but I've been the victim of a crime. That's simple. Don't say, I just shot somebody. Say, I've been the victim of a crime. There's a clear distinction. Okay? All of those things, right? So, just a quick disclaimer. We are not lawyers. No, not we are a lawyer. not giving legal advice. Not, I'm not giving legal <laughs> advice. But um, U.S. Law Shield is, is a good group. Yep. So I would probably consider some form of, uh, of carry insurance. Uh, it's out there. It's, it's certainly a cost to consider. And it's not that expensive. Mm -hmm. Might be something worth doing. Maybe. Just look into it. See what you think. <laughs> so the last thing that we were going to discuss was support gear. And um, this could be, you know, if you've got a, a rifle, okay, and you want to have kind of a go kit, you might want to have a carrier. You might want to have some armor. You might want to have uh, some storage for your magazines. You might want to have a thigh holster for your pistol. You might yeah. want to have some medical gear. I mean, medical gear is one thing that we didn't even think yeah, about. A hydration system. I mean, yeah, yeah, so medical is a big part of it as well. The most important thing, I believe, to being a gun owner is, y yes, if, if someone tries to hurt you or your family or someone around you, you want to be able to do what you need to do to stop the threat. But if you're able to stop a threat and you're able to cause harm, you need to be able to also help people mm. if they're hurt, right? And, and I believe that that's a double standard. Mm. A lot of people ignore medical, but ch the chances of you needing medical to help someone that's in need, honestly, vastly outweigh uh, the chances that you're actually gonna have to draw a firearm to hurt someone yeah. that's trying to hurt you, right? So I think that ignoring medical is almost criminal. Uh, I mean, it's important mm. uh, to make sure you're staying on top of that medical. A good yeah. blowout kit, uh, I know, um, uh, skinny medic over there at a uh, medical gear outfitters he's got a bunch of great blowout kits ranging from you know super uber fancy level all the way down to the real basic stuff to actually on says it on want. the website too super uber fancy ifac yeah uh, uh, yeah <laughs> if it's not a thing if it's not a thing now it should be okay i'm just going to say that but it's important to be medically prepared because yeah. and, and look the chances of someone getting hurt in general, let's just say not even including firearms, is much greater than you gonna, you know, have the chance of actually drawing your firearm and using it, right? So yep. you're gonna run into someone that might get hurt. They might have just fallen and gotten a really bad cut or, or broke, you know, whatever, right? Mm. People get hurt in a wide variety of different ways that aren't gun related. So having medical is important mm. and that's almost a whole nother 
consideration besides this video, but it is, I believe, being medically prepared is a cornerstone of being a gun owner as well, and that's Absolutely. a cost that you need to consider. Now, that support gear. Uh, some people might want to, you know, go as far as getting like a good set of body armor. Uh, we work with AR-500 Armor. Uh, they're great. The guys at Spartan Armor make really good stuff. Uh, the guys at Safe Life Defense make really nice flexible armor that's really handy. HESCO makes some really cutting edge ceramics and, and other composite type armors that are lightweight uh, and, you know, very, very strong. You just okay. fill them up with sand, right? No. <laughs> Not that kind of HESCO <laughs> barrier. Not <laughs> that kind <laughs> of HESCO barrier. We're talking HESCO armor. Well, same people, <laughs> but HESCO armor. But <laughs> there are tons of great armor companies out there that make really great armor and they all come in at very very different price points and they all come in at very different weights and threat levels so armor is a talking point that is completely out of the scope of this video because we don't have time to discuss all the different types of armor but just know that armor is a consideration you need to make in terms of cost that with a carrier and armor setup, you're probably looking at anywhere from two hundred to twelve hundred dollars, depending on what you buy. Yep, absolutely. If you buy, you know, fancy lightweight level four plates and a fancy tactical tailor carrier, and you get trauma pads and all of this stuff, yeah, uh, you're, you're probably looking at a thousand dollar set of body armor or more. Easily. Yeah, I mean, some of those plates can run three hundred fifty dollars per plate. But you know, given the situation, which is very unlikely for you to be in, it could save your life. I right. Mean, so. And armor is also an extremely passive way to protect yourself. Body armor is something you can have without even needing to own a gun. Uh, let's just say you want to have the protection. You can have a medical kit and body armor, and you don't even need to own a gun to have that, and that's a very passive way to protect yourself if you wish to do so. Uh, now, support gear, we'll, we'll briefly discuss support gear. He mentioned, you know, yeah, being able to carry extra magazines, medical, maybe a hydration system like a Camelback or the ones that I'm a big fan of. I like Camelbacks. You usually hold about a liter, liter and a half of water or more, depending on the size. Um, so you might need to take the show on the road, right? You might need to physically move around with your armor, magazines, uh, you know, medical, all of these things. You might want to have a, a pistol mounted to your carrier or like in a drop leg. All of those accoutrements and accessories cost additional money. And if that's the level down the rabbit hole that you want to go, you need to consider that that's an additional cost. Mm -hmm. And many times, like getting back to the training, there are many training course courses where the trainers are going to require certain types of gear in order mm -hmm. to take the course. You might need to be, to be able to support a backup pistol in addition to your carbine. Uh, you you might they might require at least a minimum of a good sling. Yep. Right. Certain things in the class are going to require you to switch from a, a primary weapon to a secondary weapon. Or it may require you to sling the rifle and go over a barrier. You know, certain things like that they're going to teach you require certain support gear in order to make sure you can perform the task in a safe uh, manner. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's just something to consider. Moving around with your firearms is an important thing. Yep. And I suppose the last thing in that support gear would be stuff like range bags, mm -hmm. cases. Um, you know, a good padded case with extra um, spots for magazines, mm -hmm. accessories, obviously keeping your firearm safe, transporting it to and from the range. Those are important considerations. Uh, 511 makes an outstanding range bag. I love their range bags. Blackhawks range bags are outstanding. I love them all. I've, I've been really digging uh, their diversion line, which is a very kind of plain Jane, everyday um, looking setup from Blackhawk, which I really like. Uh, the stuff that Kanai is mm -hmm. making is absolutely fantastic. Kanai is making some of the best uh, range bags and things like that you could possibly ever ask for. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of great stuff out there mm -hmm. uh, in that regard. Hazard 4 does a great job with their stuff. Um, Condor makes some really nice entry-level gear. Uh, Tactical Tailor is one of my favorites for uh, support gear. Uh, his stuff's a little pricey, but he is a great dude, and he makes wonderful, wonderful products. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so that gives you a few things to look into. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say maybe circling back to the, the medical aspect of it, uh, just one thought that I had was if you if you purchase a firearm it, you know, to uh, defend yourself, defend your family, that sort of thing, whether it be pistol, rifle, shotgun, whatever the case is, and you train for it, you're training to take a life ultimately, okay? A lot of people don't like to think that, but ultimately you are training to possibly take a life if it's necessary, okay? But it's to save a life. To save a life, okay? Right. But you should, if you train to take a life, you should train to save a life as well. That's where the medical aspect comes in. Um, I think that every good gun owner 
you know, worth their salt really needs to have a good basic trauma course and some medical supplies and know how to use them because like Eric said, nine times out of 10, probably 99 times out of 100, you would need medical more than you would need that firearm for a given situation. But if you're a gun owner and you've got that mindset that you want to own a gun, you probably have this preparedness mindset. Like, I just want to be ready for things when they go kind of crazy. You know, I want to have a gun for protection. I mean, a gun is the epitome of self-protection and self-preservation. I mean, it is a very useful tool for self-preservation. It is one of the best tools for the job. I mean, it's a lot better than a sharp stick. So, it's a feeling that can't be replaced either. No, absolutely not. Once you become a gun owner and you realize that safety net that you feel in your everyday life, it you feel naked without it. You do. And I know that's hard for people to consider, especially if you're a new gun owner. You haven't really gotten it yet, but once it clicks, you'll never want to be without your gun because it's a level of safety that you feel that you have, and yep. it's, it's an empowerment that every person, I believe, that doesn't own a gun is missing out on. Mm -hmm. Like, And it's not like a... It's not a macho thing or it's not a complex thing. Like a lot of people make it out to be this complex. Oh, well, this guy just wants to get in a fight or hurt somebody. It's not that. It's not a complex thing. It's just simply being safe, right? Mm -hmm. No one looks at a person that puts on their seatbelt and goes, huh, you're wearing that seatbelt because you got some safety complex. You're worried about, you know, oh, you're, you're safety, Sally. Or they don't go, oh, well, you have a vehicle that has airbags in them. Oh, well, you're just worried about getting in a wreck. Why do you need those airbags? Well, if airbags and seat belts and all these other safety measures and you buy car insurance, I mean, just in case, right? So it's yep. the same type of thing. A gun is literally in a, your own little insurance policy for your life that you can cash in right that moment. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of goes back to the old adage of, you know, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I mean, you could ultimately sum up gun ownership just like that. All right, so we'll end, end this video by saying that the biggest cost to consider about being a gun owner Beyond all of this is the cost of not being one. Indeed. That, that is the worst cost of all. Because if you don't have one, no matter, you, money you can replace, mm -hmm. yourself you can't. So not owning one is the worst, the, the biggest cost of all, because at the time that you need it the worst and you have to have it and you don't have it, it doesn't matter if that gun costs a million dollars. If you ain't got it, and, it's, and your life ends, unfortunately, because of it, there's no amount of money that can replace you. Yep, absolutely. So consider investing in your safety and your future. And uh, it's just something to consider. So guys, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Uh, we hope that it didn't drag on too long, but there were several bullet points that we had to discuss. We hope you enjoyed it. If you're a new gun owner, welcome to the fold. We want you here, trust me. Uh, gun owners greatly, greatly have a... A, a very big sense of personal responsibility. We want to help other people. We want to be assets to our community, assets to each other. We want to protect our families, our communities, and it's super important. And we welcome you to that fold, and we want all the new gun owners that are out there to understand what the lifestyle really means. And in this case, obviously, we're talking about the hidden costs of that lifestyle, but they are there. So maybe take that information for what you will and uh, go forth in liberty and be happy and protect your people. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for watching. Uh, many more videos on the way. Uh, definitely want to take a moment to thank all the folks who purchased man cans over on the website, those of you who purchased t-shirts over on Ballistic Inc., and all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for making these videos possible and being a part of what we do and seeing value in what we do. Uh, it's super important, especially right now. And thank you guys so much for the support. And uh, if you have any questions, leave a comment below and we'll all, you know, all of us, our viewers and us, uh, will try to answer any of the questions you might have. So we'll be happy to help. Uh, have a great day and we'll see you next time. Any more videos on the way. Take care, guys.